God is a love, a loving God. He is the God of love. God is love. God sent his only begotten son so that we would understand the nature of God is love. Many of you know that I spent most of January in a country called Myanmar. Traveling the country, we met with many of our brothers and sisters there that were part of the Anglican communion, part of our Anglican brothers and sisters. Burma, Burma or Myanmar, is a country that is majority Buddhist, about 90%. Of that population in Myanmar, Christians make up 5 to 7%. And of that 5 to 7, the Anglican communion there is just a fraction. During that, that experience, I, I had a number of life-changing events. That's easy to say, but it's true. We traveled the country, we met people. I even had a chance to preach in a small church in the middle of the jungle in a place that didn't even have a road to get there. <coughs> Amazing. I preached in a church barefoot and in a skirt. <laughs> That's for another sermon. <laughs> While I was there, we had the opportunity to meet with a number of parishes and diocesan uh, leaders. One of the first locations we went to was in a state called Tangu, or uh, Pa'an, sorry. And in Pa'an, we had a sit-down, town hall type of a, a, a meeting where we all sat at the front, and the church leaders talked about what it meant to be Christian. They wanted to hear from us to hear what it meant to be Christian. Our specific discussion topic was what does it mean to be Christian in a country where Christians are the minority? It was a great, great conversation for the entire time that we were there. But there was one question that a young man asked. He stood up and proclaimed his gospel. He stood up and said, I am Christian, even though many of my friends ask me, how could I worship a God that is supposed to be all about love? but somehow is so jealous and petty, he won't let me worship other gods. Wow. I'm not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I'm not in Northern Virginia or the US or a place where a monotheistic <laughs> God is a given. How do I answer that question? All right, so we're going to change the scene now. Let's talk about the gospel. Our gospel today is one that we've all heard. We all know this story, right? But this is a story that's being told in a context where a monotheistic God is not guaranteed. Where a monotheistic God is not the norm. We hear the story a hundred times. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain by themselves. Jesus was transfigured right before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Moses and Elijah appeared. Then they were overcome by a bright, bright cloud, overshadowed them, and God spoke. When the disciples heard it, they fell to their faces and were greatly afraid. Jesus came to them, touched them, and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. And when they lifted their heads, they saw that no one there but Jesus, Jesus alone. So when I looked at this passage, I wondered, why this passage, why this story right here in the book of Matthew why is it placed? Because we know it's always placed where it's supposed to be. I think that the story is based in the context of that place in where this monotheistic God is not a guarantee. In the previous chapter, in 16, we read that people are asking the question, who is Jesus? When they asked, 
Jesus responded, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Well, the disciple replied, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Even his own disciples were asking the question, who is Jesus? Why is Jesus special? Jesus responds with a question, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If, if it hadn't been hot gossip in town, <clears throat> this wouldn't be an issue. We wouldn't be talking about it right now, but it obviously was. So in chapter 16, we hear the human response. Chapter 17 is the divine response. God the Father wanted to answer the question, who is he and why is he special? This lectionary comes, or this story comes in our lectionary as we finish out Epiphany. That's not a mistake. The story shows us the true nature of Christ as both divine and human, human and divine. At the transfiguration, Jesus appears and he is transformed. Elijah and Moses appear on the mountain and God the Father spoke to the disciples and all of this was part of the Father's response, who is Jesus? Moses and Elijah represent the law and the promise to our forefathers. Moses and Elijah disappear and Jesus alone remains. One Bible commentary put it this way, the law and the prophets have served their turn and pass away. He who is the fulfillment of both alone remains. Why Jesus? A new era is on the horizon. The old covenant represented by Moses and Elijah are going to pass away and the new covenant is coming through the death and the resurrection of Christ. The new covenant is a relationship with Jesus. So how do I answer that young man in the village on the other side of the world, that young man that struggles with this question, why Jesus? At the transfiguration, God the Father and God the Son showed us who Jesus is. And suddenly the voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The disciples were terrified faces to the ground their faces ground because they were to the ground because they were humbled by the divine but jesus came over to them and touched them they were comforted not by the divine but by his humanity god the divine nature could have just said get up don't be afraid but god the son went to them touched them I imagine touching them on the shoulder, comforting them. And when they, look, when they looked, they saw only Jesus. God the Father spoke, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Why Jesus? God the Father did not say, listen to Jesus and Moses and Elijah. God the Father's final word was, listen to Jesus. So what do you think? Why Jesus? How would you answer that young man on the other side of the world in a context so removed from our own? How would you answer that young man? I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. This is what I think. God does not tell us to stop loving other gods because he is jealous, but rather because in some way that is beyond our ability to comprehend, in some way that is beyond science to prove, in some way that theologies of fancy theologians cannot explain, God is love. Why Jesus? Because God the Father sent his only son, begotten, not made, to show us the love of God. He sent his only son who was both human and divine to guide us to an understanding 
of God, to God's true nature, God's 